Welcome to the 10th lecture of ME4428, Advanced Dynamics, and we're continuing our discussion of rigid body motion. Okay, this is, represents the last lecture, um, uh, last real lecture for this course. The next lecture that we have um, will actually be in class, and we'll talk about all the different things that you might, have, uh, might be able to do with what you've learned in this course. And we're going to finish in talking about motion rigid bodies. And uh, in addition to what uh, we'll be talking about next week with all the different things you can do, we'll of course be covering um, things about the exam. Okay, so today there'll be some uh, things from chapter 7 of your text, and, and uh, I'd suggest using these notes over the, the Haim Barrel book, but where you don't understand what's going on in here, then I'd suggest looking at that book, because it is really quite helpful. We talked about the parallel axis theorem last time as well, and um, one thing we had to keep in mind is that the axes always had to be parallel. I mean, that after all is what that parallel axis theorem is all about. But what happens though when the rigid body is not aligned with the given axes? And, you know, is it necessary for you to calculate the inertia matrix using integral definitions all over again? And if you think about that, if you have a very unusual orientation for a very complicated body, that can be quite a nightmare. The answer is no. We can determine the inertia matrix even for a rotated body and we don't have to go through all these kinds of things. Def if we define two coordinate systems, OX, Y, Z, and OX prime, Y prime, Z prime, and what are called direction cosines, okay, so we have, they have a common origin, notice a capo, capo here, and we have X, X prime, Y, Y prime, Z, Z prime, the, the angles between them, okay, are theta X prime X, Y, theta y prime x, theta z prime x. It actually, from the dot product definitions, we know that the dot product between e x prime and e x, for example, is cosine of the angle between them. So cosine is theta x prime x. And this is true for all of these angles. We could define what are called direction cosines just from the definitions of the dot product of dot products of the unit vectors along each of these directions. Notice that some of these are not just so quite so simple. We'd have these these cross terms for like y prime x. So here's y prime, and then there's x. So this angle here is rather large. That's theta y prime x, and we'd have many of these kinds of angles. Not all of them are drawn in this figure, just to keep it from looking like a total mess. In general, cosine of theta i prime j is equal to the dot product of e sub i prime dot e sub j, where i prime is x prime, y prime, or z prime, and then j is either x, y, or z. If you note here, then e x prime then is, is really e x prime dot e x along the e x direction, e x prime dot e y along the e y direction, and then e x prime dot e z along the e z direction. Seems kind of strange to write it this way, but remember this, right, e x, e x here, Remember, this is just a number. It's actually a cosine, isn't it? Cosine of an angle between these two things. This is a cosine. And this is a cosine. It's not that difficult to figure out. Okay, so turns out then, if we say that, that C sub i prime j, we'll write that as a shorthand for cosine of theta i prime j, then E sub x prime is equal to C sub x prime x. See how this is just a cosine? There's the cosine, that's the cosine too. C sub x prime x, E sub x, C sub x prime y, E sub y, and then C sub x prime z, E sub z. So if we write this for all the directions then, if we could write this in a, um, um, a matrix, couldn't we? We could say this is for our, our prime side and this is for our unprime side. E sub x prime, E sub y prime, E sub z prime, well that's equal to this big matrix. We'll call it matrix C, multiplied against e sub x, e sub y, e sub z. And we could reverse the situation where we could say that e sub x, e sub y, e sub z, right, that over here, we could put that over here, and this is C inverse, assuming it exists, right, and that's going to be equal, that multiplied against the prime side over there. Then our e prime is equal to C e, and then e is equal to C inverse e prime, where this is just shorthand for the all e sub x prime, e sub y prime, e sub z prime, and this is e sub x, e sub y, e sub z. All right, and of course then c inverse is equal to the transpose of c divided by the adjoint of c. In other words, it is actually just the transpose of c. The adjoint of this cosine matrix 
Turns out that's just one. If you take C times C transpose, that's a unity matrix. In other words, all this is is one, 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 zero, 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 zeros on the off diagonals, and then ones down the diagonal. That's important for the rotation matrix. And that's what this is really all about is rotation. If we look at some vector R here, we have R is equal to X, E, X, Y, E, Y, Z, E, Z, and then we can also write it in another coordinate system, x prime e sub x prime y prime e sub y prime z prime e sub z prime. Okay, so we either chose the unprimed or the prime coordinate system. And then we could write out what's going on here. x prime is equal to r dot e sub x prime. Or in other words, we could say that's x times e sub x dot e sub x prime plus y times e sub y prime e sub y dot e sub x prime plus z e sub z dot e sub x prime. Just like we've been doing before, there's the e sub x prime, right? And then the, the y prime, well, it's r dot e sub y prime, z prime is r dot e sub z prime. And so instead of just talking about having unit vector transformation like up here and here, we could transform entire vectors. So we could go from r to r. Weren't these the same? They are the same. They are exactly the same vectors. The difference is, is we've chose two different coordinate systems. Remember how I said that when we write things in matrix format like this, we have, we have chosen a coordinate system. We've chosen a coordinate system here. We've chosen e sub x prime, e sub y prime, and e sub z prime for this arrangement. That's for our column matrix. Remember how I said if we had like a three by three matrix, that's actually a tensor. We have to choose two coordinate systems. Well, we have. We've chosen our primed coordinate system, and we've chosen our unprimed coordinate system one of each here for our system. And this is actually e sub x, e sub y, and e sub z, um, our unprimed system for this system here. Okay, so the vectors are exactly the same, but how they are represented by numbers, basically because we've chosen different coordinate systems, has changed. And then the C matrix is the link between the two representations, and as a consequence, it actually choose, it actually uses one uh, both sets of unit vectors and um, how the scalars, how, the, how this transformation perform goes between the two. If we can go the other direction as well, notice that we've re replaced here, instead of having to write the inverse, since the adjoint is just equal to 1, then we can actually use minus 1, and so then x, y, z is actually equal to c transpose x prime, y prime, z prime. We just transform the representation of the vector from one coordinate system to the other, but the, uh, the vector itself does not change, okay? Do not forget this. We, all, we also have a series of rotations, one after another. The rotations order is very important. Each rotation may be represented by a rotation matrix C, but it has to be in the correct order. If you change the order, you change the configuration of the final system. So, for example, let's say we go from one rotation, second rotation, third rotation. First time we rotate it, we do some sort of rotation, and we do another rotation, and then after that we do a third rotation. So, for example, x triple prime, well, that's c3, c2, c1 of x prime. They're nested together like this, and then this, and then that. So we've rotated once, rotated the second time, rotated a third time. First rotation is here, right there. Second rotation is here. Third rotation is here. So it's C3, C2, C1 on X, Y, Z. So C3, C2, C1 isn't equal to C1, two, three, C1, C2, C3, and that isn't equal to C3, C1, C2, and so on and so forth, necessarily. I mean, there are really very special cases where it might work, but it isn't true in general. Okay, there are other definitions for angular transformations uh, that we can talk about. Um, we can talk about all sorts of things. You can talk about having um, everything defined in terms of um, vectors that have four, four coordinates and so forth. But um, uh, we'll talk about one other system just a bit later. Okay, and this, but this is all about direction cosines. We can write the inertia tr tensor as either this, right, where we have discrete masses joined together rigidly, as we talked about before, or we could talk about writing it as an integral form, okay? It's up to you which form we use, either this form or this form. For a continuous system, of course, only really this one makes sense. 
And we could also could say that this um, this I naught prime is actually in the rotated coordinate system where we're replacing R with R prime uh, wherever we look at this. And we'll notice that R prime is actually equal to R prime squared is equal to R squared. Okay, that this vector R really isn't un unaffected by the coordinate transformation. Remember, the vector itself isn't changed. It's how its its um, representation is changed. Um, in terms of its components. Now R prime is equal to CR, right, from our transformation matrix. And R prime transpose is equal to quantity C times R, that transpose, and that's equal to R transpose C transpose. Remember you have to switch the order of these if you want to have transpose of the product of the two. And if you substitute this into the integral, okay, the integral meaning this one, then we have r squared times 1, and that's his unit matrix, and that's equal to minus cr, when well that's where we placed r prime here, and then we have um, r prime transpose, well that's r transpose c transpose, right there, as from this definition, and then so c, c transpose, okay, is equal to 1, so then naturally if we wrote 1, then that would be c, c transpose, in other words, c times 1 times C transpose and so we could we could actually put in here in the beginning C times 1 times C transpose notice that we've got C before everything here and then we've got C transpose after everything remember the pre-multiplying and post-multiplying are two different operations in, in matrix maths so we put C before and C transpose after and this in between here sandwiched in here is the original um, the original matrix for our, our moment of inertia and product of inertias. Okay, we've just found the transformation for an arbitrary rotation. We've found what our an, an inertia matrix would be for the, the a new coordinate system and compared to the old coordinate system, as long as we have some sort of idea how we've rotated to go from one coordinate system to the other through the direction cosines in C. Let's try an example here. Not too bad to do. If we have a cone with its tip at the origin and turn from the x-axis in the xy plane at an angle of 45 degrees. So we've got the cone here shown here. It's kind of difficult to see, but it's actually rotated 45 degrees from the xyz plane here with its tip at the origin of the coordinate system as a length of h, a base radius of r, and as shown. All right. So what we're going to look for is the inertia matrix for, uh, for the given coordinate system about O. We know what the inertia matrix, and if you don't, you can go look that up. Um, know what the inertia matrix is about the center of mass, the 3 tenths, 3 tenths mr squared about x. This is about the rotation, uh, the, the long axis, so it's about this direction. And then we have 3 uh, times m divided by 5, where m is the total mass of the body, um, to total mass of the cone times the quantity h squared divided by 16 plus r squared, okay, about the other two axes, and that's along this axis and say that axis, so like our x prime and z prime axes, for example. And if you notice, we've got to go from the center of mass to up here to the tip, so we have to do a parallel axis theorem transformation, and then once we've done that, then we have to rotate it by 45 degrees. So just this is how it was defined originally, and so we have to move um, the origin over here as shown here, like that, we have the parallel axis theorem, and the, the distance here that we have to move it is actually 3h divided by 4, right, because the center mass of a cone is actually one-fourth of the distance from, uh, the, uh, from the base to the tip, and so then our i about naught, this is actually c, i about o is equal to i, I about c plus m times 9h squared divided by 16 in the 2, 2, and 3, 3 positions. Notice the products of inertia are all equal to 0, as is the i sub this transformation along the x-axis direction, because there's no actually no transformation along the x-axis direction. x and x prime here are exactly uh, coincident. So this is our uh, final situation. If we didn't have to rotate the the coordinate system, but actually we do. This is what the system we have right now. Let's rotate it. 
we'll look at the coordinate system. We notice that uh, theta z, z prime uh, and theta z prime z are both equal to zero. Theta x prime x is equal to minus 45 degrees. Theta y prime y is minus 45 degrees. Theta x prime y is 135 degrees. Theta y prime x is 45 degrees. Theta x prime z is 90, as is theta z prime x, theta y prime z, and theta z prime y. And that will give us all of our direction cosines for c. As the consequence in is c is 1 over square root of 2. Um, notice the minus sign. In the upper four left, upper left four positions, then we have 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1 in the remaining positions. So the, for the rotation then, we go from, we have to go to i prime naught, and that's c i naught c transpose. I just perform a multiplication there, and we end up with the final value as shown here, where alpha is this rather complicated thing, 3, three divided by 20 m r squared, okay, plus 3 m over 10 times the quantity 5 8 h squared plus r squared. Notice that now we have products of inertia as well here. Okay, and then we can transform as well the angular momentum and rotational velocity vector omega. And if we have then our angular momentum h is equal to i omega, as we've written here as the in matrix format, then we can transform it. Uh, and what we'd say is that ch is equal to ci omega. Well, this, this i we can also transform as well. That's actually ci c transpose c omega. And what we've done is, is that C transpose C, that's actually unit value, isn't it? And then I prime is equal to, actually equal to C I C transpose, where I prime is using our rotated coordinate system, and H prime is C H, and then omega prime is C omega. And so then it turns out that H prime is equal to I prime dotted with omega prime. Mm, h prime is equal to i prime times omega prime in matrix format. And so this is using our, uh, our new coordinate system. The angular momentum or inertia angular velocity relationship is unaffected by the orientation of the coordinate system. Don't, that's important to remember as well. This means that we can represent rotation about any omega with an arbitrarily complicated i and then find what our angular momentum vector might be. We might be able to go back and look and see and find an i prime such that uh, we have no products of inertia. i prime 1, i prime 2, i prime 3, even for some sort of complicated system. And indeed we can. Uh, i prime 1, i prime 2, and i prime 3. In that situation where we have this to be true are called principal moments of inertia. And actually go to, to go about find them, we can have, we can actually go through an eigenvalue problem. And if I prime exists, then, then life is a lot simpler. It actually tells us that the angular momentum is, is right, rather simple to write. I prime 1, omega x, for example, is equal, and I prime 2 is omega y, I prime 3, omega z. These are our motions along this particular uh, set of three axes. There's more as well. H and omega are in the same direction for this situation, and so we can say that H is equal to a scalar h, the angular momentum as a vector, is equal to angular momentum as a scalar times, say, u prime, where u prime is, a, a, say, some sort of unit vector, and omega is the same uh, as a different scalar, but along the same direction. And so then, actually, it's quite nice to be able to write these two things, because what it means is, is that the angular momentum as a scalar divided by the, the angular velocity as an omega as a scalar, it can be treated as a ratio lambda, and that's just i dotted with that particular unit vector direction. And so then we can go back and look and see what this lambda value is. Notice that, again, this is the ratio between the two, and so this lambda really does have a specific meaning. And if we go back and rewrite this a bit, um, and notice that we can collect on u, right? And then so then i minus lambda 1 that quantity times u, well, it'd have to be equal to zero. So either u, the unit vector, is equal to zero, which doesn't make any sense, or this has to be equal to zero. So if we have to look at the finding a, a um, where this maps this u into the null space, or looking for the uh, for where the determinant of this i minus lambda times the unit vector is, or the 
the unit matrix is equal to 0. So if we have some i, we want to have, maybe we want to try to find our principal moments of inertia, i1, i2, i3. We know that if h, there's a vector is equal to a scalar h times u prime, u hat I should say, and then omega is equal to omega times u hat, then this is only true when we've found i1, and i2, and i3 such that the pro moments of inertia are all equal to zero. That the angular momentum and the angular velocity are along the same directions. And then we've shown some math here on the past page to show that if that's equivalent to saying that we're looking for a lambda value, which is the ratio of this angular momentum to the omega, the angular velocity. <coughs> and we can go back and look at that, and this turns out to be an eigenvalue problem because this can't, the u cannot be always equal to zero, so this must be. In other words, the determinant of this matrix arrangement must be equal to zero. Okay. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, the determinant of this matrix is either long to write out in longhand form, ixx minus lambda times quantity iyy minus lambda times izz minus lambda minus iyz squared minus ixy times quantity ixy times izz minus lambda minus iyz ixz and then you add in ixz times quantity ixy times iyz minus iyy minus lambda times ixz. That's all supposed to be equal to zero. And if we expand it and collect on our lambdas, we have lambda cubed, lambda squared, lambda and then everything else. Okay. If you've heard of Lamy constants, it turns out this looks very similar in, in structural analysis. Okay, so then it turns out that lambda has three real and non-negative uh, roots, I should say. If you find that you have lambda has imaginary roots from a real physical system, come and see me because uh, it would be really surprising if that were to work out. It turns out those roots represent the principal moments of inertia. In other words, they represent h divided by omega, uh, h1 divided by omega1, uh, for along with u1, and the and similar deal for h2 divided by omega2 along u2, and h3 divided by omega3 along u3. And of course, this is the definition of our moment of inertia about that particular axis uh, for this specific situation where they're parallel to each other. Now if we put each root in the equation then, then we can go back and we can find what this u1 hat, I should say, u hat 2 and u hat 3 are going to be. What those specific directions are that give us these uh, principal moments of inertia. And you notice that they must be perpendicular to each other or something is wrong. So if you find that you've, you've done this and you say that while well, u3 is parallel to u2, u2, something is up. Okay. It turns out that even better, the rotation matrix is, is C is given by U1, U2, and U3, where we've written them horizontally. So U1X, U1Y, U1Z, U2X, UY, U2Y, U2Z, and so forth, where we've written them along the horizontal direction as indicated here. Okay, U1 hat, U2 hat, and U3 hat are unit vectors, so they need to be normalized. U1 has a length of 1, as does U2 and, and U3. Three, okay. So then C transpose. If you wrote them in column form, then you can write it that way. This may be an easier way to re remember it. I don't know. Every rigid body has principal axes, okay, and the spin about any of those axes has a parallel angular momentum. Direction perpendicular to a plane of symmetry is always a principal direction associated with the principal moment of inertia. So if you have that situation, then you know you got yourself a principal moment of inertia. Furthermore, the plane contains the other two principal axes. And what directions those might be, it's difficult to say, but you know that the axis of a body of revolution is going to be a principal axis. The three principal moments of inertia include both the maximum moment of inertia and minimum moment of inertia. Here are some examples. I'd encourage you to go through these and see how you go. There is quite a bit to, to figure out with this. And one thing to watch, watch out for is whenever the roots are of the same, and you have to do some thinking about how to find the vectors. All right, and these actually go through all, this actually goes through all of it. 
Okay, rigid body dynamics. If we talk about the linear motion of a rigid body, it's, it is very similar to the linear motion of a collection of particles. Okay, the, the relationship between the forces applied to a rigid body and its linear motion is just the same as what we had for a collection of small bodies. Okay, it's some of the forces on the rigid body is equal to the rate change of time of its linear momentum. Angular, momentum, angular motion isn't so simple, unfortunately. You have to choose a reference point that angular motion is occurring about. We've discussed several, the origin, fixed or internal, the center of mass, and then some arbitrary point. Either it's fixed inertial or it might be moving at some velocity v sub b. If you remember that if you have rotation about O, then the relationship between the angular momentum and the inertia tensor and the angular velocity, um, it's already written, can be written like that. If it's about the center of mass, it's a similar sort of situation. And if it's about B, the external point B, then it's not quite so, not quite so easy to write. It's uh, the distance, this, this moment arm from the center of mass to point B, cross-product with the linear momentum, plus the angular momentum of the body about C. Remember that? We derived all of that. And this turns out to be about C. Notice that the, the angular velocity here is omega C, not omega B. Okay. The fourth situation is that HB dot actually turns out to be different for cases 3 and 4 referring back to the fact that when the velocity of b is 0 for 3 and not 0 for 4. The matrix representation is fairly clear. There's no matrix representation for cross products that I can write to you, write for you in this particular course. And so then for the cases 3 and 4, it's not so easy to write out, write out this stuff. Okay, so you can use these equations with the expressions relating torque and angular momentum about some point we've derived before for a collection of particles. We have Newton's second law, angular momentum and torque, right, as we've shown here in all of these cases. Notice that this is um, about a, an arbitrary point B moving in velocity V sub B, okay? And we can write out what our angular momentum, momentum, momentum of inertia, tensor, and angular velocity relationships are in matrix form, okay? The derivative of angular momentum, well, um, it's related back to talking about what we were talking about earlier today. We have also our kinetic energy that we can talk about, all right, as shown here. Now, we want to talk about maybe rotations, and We talk about potential energy as well, mgz sub c, where cap m is the total mass of the system. And you treat the center of mass as being the point at which you worry about what the entire mass is doing when you're talking about potential energy. Okay. And dissipative energy, you can define that as well, rotational and linear dis uh, dissipation. And then m is a moment and is equal to torque t. And then we can talk about uh, maybe an example here. Uh, please take a look through this in the, in the lecture notes. Here's another example. A cord passes over the top of a massless, frictionless pulley as shown, carrying a mass M on one end and around a cylinder M2, which rolls in a horizontal plane, and the cylinder doesn't slip. And you can find the acceleration of this mass. And what it requires you to do is do free body diagrams and to consider the rotation of the body um, in the cylinder in addition to the linear motion of the mass. And then also we could talk about Lagrange's equations as well, or to have the rotation and to consider in there. This is, and then we also have torque on an angular displaced shaft and so forth. Now, Euler's angles well, are commonly used to describe the orientation of a body with respect to a reference frame through a series of pure rotations. They uniquely determine the orientation of a body, unlike direction cosines. For example, if I give you a set of direction cosines by transformation matrix C, and we say that the original coordinate system is never, it doesn't change, and we try to say, oh, right, we have these direction coordinate, these changes, uh, tell me what the final coordinate system looks like. There's probably three or four different configurations that would give you the same C matrix. It doesn't work the same way with Euler's angles. 
you have a set of numbers or Euler's angles, you know exactly what it's going to look like. Euler's angles are defined through a set of three consecutive rotations. And unfortunately, the order and the definition of these uh, depends on the text. And it's really a problem. But so uh, if, you, if you want to learn something, then try learning what I'm showing you here. And then uh, be consistent with it, and you'll keep track of it. Here, the rotations are rotation about a z-axis through an angle phi to define the z prime, eta prime, zeta prime axes. Again, this is this is z, this is eta, and this is zeta. All right, z prime, eta prime, zeta prime, and then we rotate about the z prime axis through an angle theta to produce z eta zeta axes, and then finally we rotate about the zeta prime axis through an angle psi. All right, that's psi, isn't it? To produce one, two, three axes. So we're actually going from cap x, cap y, cap z axes to one, two, three axes, as shown here. So we go from x, y, x, y, z to z, z prime, eta prime, zeta prime, and then we go from um, that to z, eta, zeta, and then from the z, eta, zeta to our one, two, three. So if you notice, we rotate about this, the z direction, the phi, about the z prime, z, z axis of uh, angle of theta, and then we rotate again here about the zeta um, by an angle of psi. So it's as if you take this this dislike shape, we rotate flat, and then we rotate it sort of to the side, and then we rotate it again. Something like this. Z, z prime, eta prime, zeta prime is equal to, to this matrix. So this is a transformation matrix from x, y, z. And we'll say that's our delta, okay, on x, y, z. Then z, eta, z, z, eta, zeta is equal to z, z prime, eta prime, zeta prime with this pre-multiplication for our transformation matrix. We'll call that gamma. And then x1, x2, x3, those are 1, 2, 3 axes directions. That's related back to z, eta, zeta through this transformation matrix, and we'll call that beta. If you nest them together, then we've got beta, gamma, delta on x, y, z. Well, that's x1, x2, x3. Something like this. Okay. Beta, gamma, delta is in A, B, Z, where A, B, and C are written as here as one big matrix. In other words, something like this. Cosine psi, cosine phi, minus sine psi, sine, uh, cosine theta, sine phi is our first uh, upper left-hand term. And the other terms are shown here. Notice that the lower right-hand term is just cosine theta. Okay, when the body rotates, the rotation may be represented by in terms of Euler angles. And you notice then, if you look back at how these angles are rotating, then they have all different axes. We have three different coordinate systems that we're using. Omega is given by uh, phi dot along e sub cap z, theta dot along e sub z, and then psi dot along e sub 3. And then, so we had to go through this, this almost nightmarish experience of trying to relate the coordinate system directions with each other. Like, for example, e sub cap z is equal to cosine theta e sub 3 plus sine theta e sub eta prime. And then e sub 3 is equal to cosine theta e sub z minus sine theta e sub eta prime. Then e sub z is equal to cosine psi e sub 1 minus sine psi e sub 2, and so on and so forth, in a way that tells us that we can write omega. Is This looks nice and simple, but it's not, because these are three different coordinate directions and three different coordinate systems. And this is actually, in terms of one coordinate system, is shown here. Omega is equal to e sub 1 times quantity phi dot sine psi sine theta plus theta dot cosine psi plus e2 phi dot cosine psi sine theta minus theta dot sine psi plus e3 phi dot cosine theta plus psi dot in the body axes. What, the body ox what are the body axes? These are the axes that are going around with the rotating body. Okay, so omega 1, e1, omega 2, e2, omega e3, e3. We can write it in terms of the x, y, z or the fixed reference axes as well. The expression is different because the coordinate axes are different. 
the vector itself is exactly the same. If we choose the body, then we're talking about the 1, 2, 3. If we choose the environment, we're talking about the fixed coordinate system, that cap X, cap Y, cap Z, reference axes, and that's given below. Okay. These different expressions become useful when calculating the kinetic energy. We can talk about the kinetic energy when we have maybe the use the principal moments of inertia, then we would use our, our body axes and talk about talk about that in terms of the Euler's angles and it would be written as shown here. Euler's equa equations of motion? Well, remember now well, this is actually your equation of motion uh, like Newton's second law. This is a torque placed about um, on, on the body about say a, a point O equals the time derivative of the angular momentum about the same point as shown here. And if it turns out if we have each of these omegas written out in terms of the Euler angles, then it can be rather large to write out. You can write this out either in terms of body coordinates, E1, E2, E3, or you can write it out in terms of the environmental coordinates. This same, whole same development works if we use point C, the center of mass, as a reference. And this equation that we come up with actually represents a set of equations of motion. This is like uh, the omega dot, so sub O1, so this is the angular acceleration of the body about along the one axis direction. And this is actually nonlinear omega about the second axis and omega about the third axis multiplied together and so on and so forth. Turns out that this equation is in, uh, difficult to solve in general. We can make a few simplifying assumptions like torque-free motions, for example, so we can set all of these torques equal to zero to find out what's going on. And we can solve some problems this way. We can also treat an axisymmetric body, and if the three axis is aligned along the axis of symmetry, then we can go about solving the problem as well. So using this uh, equation, and presuming that we have I sub not 1 is equal to I sub not 2 and I sub 3 is along the symmetry axis and then we have no torques, then we end up with this equation and we end up with um, a problem that we actually can go about solving. Omega not 3, it turns out to be constant, so the rotation about that particular axis, the axis of symmetry turns out to be constant, and the other two are coupled together. And actually in the computer lab uh, for this particular uh, and lecture, we can actually can go back and look at what happens with these. There's a lot of interesting things you can do with this that it's just going to be beyond our time to be able to cover. So what I tried to show you is the use of Euler angles in describing orientation, velocity, and equations of motion for a rigid body. I also tried to show you about um, the moments of inertia and products of inertia and how you'd handle all of that if you rotated the, the coordinates that represent the system. And what this all presents you, allows you to do is to represent and describe the three-dimensional motion of a body in a way much more convenient than with the direction cosines that we talked about early on. And we'll go through specific examples, but do please go through the, the examples that have been shown here. Thank you.